lost all of his composure. He thought, and he said, Krishna, how can I kill my relatives? Then our spoils, the victory spoils, would be tainted with their blood. And Arjuna began to give so many very good moral reasons why he shouldn't fight. And then Krishna proceeds to respond to Arjuna's arguments. Here are some of Arjuna's arguments. He said, O oh Krishna, seeing my friends and relatives standing before me, I feel that all the limbs of my body are quivering and my mouth is drying up. My whole body is trembling and my hairs are standing on end. Just imagine if you go out to war and then you see that your father or your brother is on the other side. What would happen? My bow, Gandiva, is slipping from my hand and my skin is burning. Now I can't stand here any longer. I'm forgetting myself and my mind is reeling. I foresee only evil, O killer of the Kesi demon. Krishna killed so many demons uh, in his uh, childhood, in his babyhood even, in his youth, because he's the Supreme Lord himself, so even as a baby there's no problem for him to kill 12 mile long demons. So it's very significant that Arjuna is calling him, O killer of the Kesi demon. He said, your name is the killer of the Kesi demon, that is Kesi Sudana, Sudana means killer of. You're the killer of the big giant horse demon, Kesi. You're not known as Nanda Sudan. You're not known as the killer of your father, Nanda Maharaj, or the killer of your brother. So why are you asking me to kill my brothers now? I do not see how any good can come from this killing of our own kinsmen. And therefore, I can't desire any subsequent victory. Of what availed to us this happiness or kingdoms or even life itself when those for whom we want to enjoy the victory are standing before us in this battlefield? Why does anybody want to gain anything so he can show off? Come to my house, see my new furniture, see my new wife. We want to show off to our friends and relatives. So he's saying, if I'm killing all my friends and relatives, then what's the purpose of gaining the victory of the world. I won't be able to show off to anybody or share with anybody. I'm not prepared to fight, even, ex even in exchange for all the wealth in all the three worlds. So we can see that Arjuna is very um, renounced. Even though he's a prince, even though he's a millionaire, billionaire, still he's very renounced. And he addresses Krishna as the husband of the goddess of fortune. Krishna has unlimited expansions. God has unlimited expansions who preside over unlimited spiritual worlds beyond this material world. I don't know what you folks in England or Bangladesh or Poland learned in school, but when I, when I was a kid and I went to school, they said there's only nine planets and this is the only planet that's really inhabited by human beings. Everywhere else there's dust and maybe some microorganisms. But here's the only place where there's intelligent human beings. But in the Vedas, in the ancient Indian scriptures, we learn that there are millions and billions of planets in one universe. And there are millions and billions of universes with uh, personalities who are much, much more intelligent than us human beings. And beyond all the material universes, there's a spiritual universe where all the planets are called Vaikuntha, that means without anxiety, and they're unlimited in length and breadth. And each Vaikuntha planet is presided over by an expansion of Krishna called Vishnu. And each Vishnu form has as his consort a goddess of fortune who all the demigods, even the demigods who control the rain and the heat and the drought, 
and the sun, all those demigods worship the goddess of fortune. And there are un unlimited... Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> there are unlimited goddesses of fortune who are the consorts of unlimited Vishnu expansions of Krishna. So Arjuna is telling Krishna, O oh, husband of the goddess of fortune, how can we become happy by killing our own kinsmen? In other words, he's saying that you're the husband of the goddess of fortune, so you, why do you want me to be unfortunate? He's being a little sarcastic with jokes. Even though Krishna is God, Arjuna is Krishna's uh, relative and very good friend. So the teaching there is that even though Krishna breathes in and out millions of universes, with every exhalation, millions of universes come out, and with every inhalation, millions of universes are withdrawn, and these incarnation Vishnu, who breathes in and out the universe, is only one-fifth of a portion of Krishna. A portion of a portion of a portion of a portion of a portion. Five times removed. So, Krishna is so great, and we're very tiny. But, if we become Krishna's devotees, then we have an intimate relationship with him. Just like... Um, Say, let's take your toe. Your toe is very small and insignificant. It's the lowest part of the body. And here I am, the body, or me and the body. So, because my toe is attached to my body, if the slightest thing goes wrong with my toe, especially if it gets really cut and like halfway falls off or something, I'm prepared to spend millions of dollars to have an operation to save that toe. And if it just gets stubbed, then immediately all my attention goes to my toe and I don't know anything else but that toe. Similarly, even though we're all tiny, little, teeny, in insignificant living entities, and there are unlimited of us, not only in the human form, but in birds and beasts and trees and all the millions of planets, if we become a surrendered soul to Krishna like Arjuna and a very dear friend, then Krishna gives all his attention to us. He's so great, he's so complete, that although so many complete units emanate from him, like this material cosmic manifestation, he remains the complete balance. So therefore he can give himself fully to one person, and he remains complete and full to give himself to the next person. So, Arjuna is uh, talking with Krishna in this intimate way. He said, although these men, overtaken by greed, that is his cousin brothers, although they see no fault in destroying a family and quarreling with friends, why should we, who are in knowledge of the sin, engage in such activities? And then he goes on to explain how with the destruction of a dynasty, then there's nobody pr to protect the ladies, and all um, uh, unscrupulous men will exploit the ladies, and then there'll be unwanted population. And unwanted population means uh, quarreling and in wars all over the world. So he's giving so many arguments. I've heard from the disciplic succession, Arjuna tells Krishna, that those who destroy family tradition, they dwell in hell. And it's a fact also, in, the, in a certain portion of the Vedic literatures, for those who um, are not eligible for pure devotion to God, they're taught that uh, moral principles and proper relationships with families is the highest perfection. In fact, it's stated in one of the scriptures regarding... Uh, material, pious life, that if one does not take care of his uh, father properly, if one does not serve his father, then he will have to, um, even if he goes to heaven, he'll have to eat his own flesh. 
So when Krishna's expansion, Lord Ramchandra came to this world 5,000 uh, millions of years ago and performed his beautiful divine activities. He was staying at the ashram of Augusta Rishi and while they were talking, a very beautiful uh, celestial airplane flew down from heaven, very full of jewels and very brilliant and effulgent, and this uh, very lovely man, looking like he's not from this planet, very celestial, wearing crown, very opulent, he came out of the airplane he walked over to the side of the river and he, um, there was a dead body lying there and he started eating that dead body. So uh, Lord Ram said to the sage, what's going on here? So the sage explained that he didn't take care of his father and so the, by the Vedic injunction he had to come and eat his own flesh of his previous dead body. So Lord Ram said, said, oh yes, that shows me I should continue to serve the mission of my father. I'm doing the right thing. So unless one is a devotee, uh, then he's bound by Vedic injunctions to serve in the most moral way. Um, so th these are the arguments that Arjuna is giving to Krishna. How strange it is, Arjuna said, that we are preparing to commit greatly sinful acts driven by the desire to enjoy royal happiness. It would be better if the sons of Dhritarashtra were to kill me, unarmed and unresisting, rather than fight with them. So he's being nonviolent and very moralistic. Thus, after he said everything, he just flopped down on his chariot, couldn't even stand, and said, Oh Govinda, Govinda is another name of Krishna, meaning the uh, one who gives pleasure to all the senses. In fact, why did he call Krishna Govinda? Govinda, you're supposed to be the one who gives pleasure to all the senses, but you're not giving me any pleasure. You're not giving my senses any pleasure. So he's playing the part. Arjuna and Krishna are like in a theatrical performance, playing the part because actually Arjuna could never be an illusion. Krishna's devotee could never be bewildered by the bodily conception of life or attachment to material society, friendship and love over his devotion to Krishna. But they're acting for our benefit. So, O oh Govinda, you're supposed to be the one who gives pleasure to the senses, but you're not giving any pleasure to my senses here. So, our Srila Prabhupada explains in the purport that what it means that Govinda is the giver of pleasure to the senses is that if you serve Krishna, then automatically, if you serve Krishna's senses, Hrishikena, Hrishikesha Sevanam, Bhaktiya, Uchate. If you serve Krishna's senses with all of your senses, then your senses will become pleased and perfect and purified so much so that you can see the kingdom of God face to face. You can see your own soul. Just like if you look in a mirror and the mirror is full of dust. You can't see anything but the dust. But if you clean off the dust then you can see yourself, you can see your friends, you can see the world around you. So now the mirror of our heart is covered by the dust of the bodily conception of life. And by becoming a devotee of Krishna, we become free from that, and we realize we're eternal soul. And then we see everyone as soul, and then we love everybody without discrimination, even the trees, even the ants, even the fish. So, he said, he was overwhelmed with grief, and he said, I'm not fighting. So now let's see what Krishna's reply is. Very interesting. We'll be discussing now, that was how chapter 1 ended. So now we'll be reading chapter 2, which is Krishna's reply. <coughs> Sanjaya said, Sanjaya is 
You see that personality in the, the red turban and the red, red uh, shawl, shutter? So he is the secretary of the blind king, Dhritarashtra, who is the father of all the people on the bad guy's side. And they're against Krishna's devotees, and they unlawfully usurp the kingdom and try to use it for their own purposes. So um, Sanjaya is relating to Dhritarashtra what's happening on the battlefield. So Sanjaya said, Seeing Arjun full of compassion and very sorrowful, his eyes brimming with tears, Krishna Madhusudan spoke the following words to the grief-stricken Arjun. Krishna is called Madhusudan here because he killed a very great giant horrendous demon named Madhu. So now Krishna is going to be killing the demons of doubt and confusion in Arjuna's heart. So the Supreme Personality of God had said, My dear Arjuna, how have these impurities come upon you? Impurity means the bodily conception of life. How have these impurities come upon you? They are not at all befitting a man who knows the progressive values of life, the real spiritual values of life. They do not lead to higher planets, but only to infamy. He urges Arjun, O oh Arjun, do not yield to this degrading impotence. It does not become you. Give up this petty weakness and heart, and arise, O oh chastiser of the enemy. So what is Krishna doing, and what is Arjun doing? Arjun is like a person, suppose you are sleeping over your friend's house, and your friend is having a bad dream. You're sleeping in the same room as your friend, and he's having a bad dream, or she if you're a lady. And your friend is dreaming that he's being chased by a tiger, and he's falling off a cliff, and the tiger jumped down off the cliff, and starting to swallow him and eat him up and he's screaming. So in his dream, your friend is screaming, this tiger is trying to eat me. So suppose you're sleeping over your friend's house and you see that. What will you do? Will you say, don't worry, I'll save you. Just run this way. Here, let's get a knife. I'll kill the tiger. <laughs> you won't do that at all. What you'll do is probably smile, maybe chuckle a little bit and say, wake up, everything's okay. So that's what Krishna is doing to Arjun, seeing Arjun sleeping in the nescience of the bodily conception of life. Because actually, anybody who would die on that battlefield, he would get liberation from the pangs of birth and death. So there's no problem. The only problem is Arjun's illusory conception of life. Then Arjun said, O killer of Madhu, how can I counterattack with arrows in battle men like Bhishma and Drona who are my superiors? Drona is uh, Arjun's uh, archery teacher. He's the one who taught him how to fight in the first place. And Bhishma is his grandfather who brought him up. It's better to live in the world by begging than to live at the cost of the lives of great personalities whom are superiors. Nor do we even know which is better, conquering them or being conquered by them. The sons of Dhritarashtra, whom if we killed we will not care to live, are standing before us on this battlefield. Now Arjun realizes that he's confused. He says, now I'm confused about my duty, and I've lost all composure due to weakness. Now, O Krishna, please tell me what is best for me. Now I am your disciple, and a soul surrendered unto you. Please instruct me. So when they were talking as friends, then it was just a back and forth. But now, Arjuna realizes that I'm not getting anywhere. 
I'm saying all my arguments, but my arguments aren't making me happy. My conception of my life, who I am, is not making me happy. So he says, okay, now I surrender. Now instruct me. So as soon as Arjun surrendered, now he's going to be getting very, very good advice. And in here, in the second chapter, our spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada, explains that one should accept uh, Krishna as his spiritual master. And when Krishna is not so-called physically present, then one should accept a bona fide representative of Krishna who is as good as Krishna. And what does it mean to be as good as Krishna? He's 100% Krishna conscious. One who is 100% Krishna conscious is uh, develops the same qualities as Krishna. Even though he's not God, he manifests and develops the qualities of God. Just like, suppose you take birth in a very, very rich family. You just took birth there. So what happens? You're going to be rich. And if the family is beautiful, you're going to be beautiful. So anyone who enters into Krishna's family of surrendered souls, he shares with God God's qualities. So Arjuna is continuing to surrender. I cannot find any means to drive away this grief which is drying up my senses, nor will I be able to um, get rid of it even if I win an unrivaled kingdom on the earth with sovereignty like demigods in heaven. Still, I can't get rid of this grief that's driving me mad. So then he just sat down. Oh, Govinda! I shall not fight. So what did Krishna do? He had a friend who was sleeping. So then Krishna, smiling in the midst of both the armies, spoke the following words to the grief-stricken Arjun. And what did he say? Sri Bhagavan Uvacha Vasochantan Vasochantan Pragyavadam Chabhashase Katasana Gatasans Cha Nanu Sochanti Panditaha. The Blessed Lord said, While speaking learned words, Arjun, about sin and family tradition and protection of the women and compassion and nonviolence, while speaking learned words, you are mourning for what is not worthy of grief. For the wise lament, neither for the living nor for the dead. Because never was there a time Never was there a time that I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, people, all of you. And nor in the future will any of us cease to be. Then he continues. Day, everybody together. Day he no sminjata dehi komaram jovanam jaha. As the embodied soul continually passes in this body, well, you say the rest, I forgot it. Without looking. Majukeshi? Loud? You're on TV. The embodied soul passes in this body from from boyhood to youth to old age. Uh, similarly, the soul is going from body to other body as part of that. And a and a self-realized soul is not disturbed. Uh, Very good. Thank you. As the embodied soul continually passes in this body from childhood to youth to old age. Similarly, at the time of death, he passes to a completely new body. 
and the self-realized soul is not bewildered by such a change. Just like, what's your name? Premananda, good name. Wow. So, when you were, you were a baby once, and you had a two-year-old body, right? Where is that two-year-old body? Uh, is it there? Where is your two-year-old body? Uh, Nowhere to be seen, is it? Actually, I don't understand you. Oh, before, you were two years old. Yeah. Right? Yeah, of course. So where is your two-year-old body? <laughs> it's, uh, it's gone. Yeah. Where is your ten-year-old body? No. Huh? No. Your ten-year-old body. Ten years. It's gone. Yeah. But are you gone? <coughs> no, you're still here. So you must not have been that body. Right? Yeah. And in 30 years, when you're maybe 60, where will, how old are you now? 30? 25? Yeah, 25. So where will this 25-year-old body be in another 25 years? It won't be here anymore, but you'll still be here. So Krishna is saying, so including the time of death, we're also not finished. We go on to the next body. Since the beginning of time, we've been going from body to body to body. Transfer. I'm sorry? Transfer. Transfer. Yeah, transfer. Good. Then he continues, so since you're not the body, Arjuna, why are you getting so upset? Because just as the non-permanent appearance of happiness and distress, they arrive from sense perception, O Arjuna. So one should, just like winter and summer seasons, they also come and go, and nobody's disturbed by them. So. You should not be disturbed by the comings and goings of the happiness and distress in this world because they arrive, they arise and they disappear just like the coming and going of winter and summer seasons. So therefore, one should learn to tolerate them. Tongs to tiksha sapharita. One should learn to tolerate them without being disturbed. What happens to a person who's not disturbed? A person who's not disturbed by happiness and distress and is steady in both is certainly eligible for liberation. Well, then you may say, you know, easier said than done. How is it possible to be not disturbed by happiness or distress? If I lose a hundred dollars, if it fell out of my pocket while I was walking, how am I not going to be disturbed by that? If I understand that I'm not this body, but I'm a pure spirit soul, then I'm not disturbed by the comings and goings. Then I realize that it has something to do with my karma, or it has something to do with Krishna's mercy to detach me from that hundred dollar bill that I was so attached to. So many ways to look at it, but the devotee is actually not disturbed. If he gets a million dollars, he's not elated, and if he loses a million dollars, he's not disturbed. Just like um, a bank teller. A bank teller, you know, you've all been to the bank, and you may give the bank teller a lot of money, and he does a thing with his computer, and then he puts it in the cash register, and is he very happy that he got that money? And then if he gives you five thousand dollars. Is he very sad that he's just given you five thousand dollars? No. If he was, we'd think he was crazy. So similarly, although we can't imagine it now, being so free from the comings and goings, when we chant Hare Krishna and offer our food to Krishna and read about Krishna and sing about Krishna and become Krishna's devotee, then we can see that Actually, this material world is very insignificant because he has something much, much better. If I don't have something better, <coughs> then naturally I'll be attached. But if I have something a million times better, then what do I care if I lose a penny? Those who are seers of the truth have concluded that of the non-existent 
there's no endurance. And of the existent, there's no cessation. This, seers have concluded by studying the nature of both in normal English terms. This means that the body will never last very long. And the soul, which is our real self, it will never stop. So why give all of our attention to something that's at every moment decaying when we should give attention to our real self, which is eternal, and which we now can't experience? And if we don't give attention to it, then we'll have to suffer birth, old age, disease, and then death, and then we don't know where we're going next. Know, Krishna says, that that which pervades the entire body is indestructible. No one can destroy the imperishable soul. Only the material body of the imperishable, immeasurable, indestructible soul is subject to destruction. Therefore, don't be disturbed. Just like, suppose, Premananda Prabhu, that you take off your shirt and put it in the washing machine. Would you get all bent out of shape if you, um, if when your clothes get all bent out of shape in the washing machine and your clothes are drowning in the soap suds and getting all wrinkled? You say, oh no, I'm getting wrinkled. No. Is my English clear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So similarly, one who's actually situated on the platform of transcendence or Krishna consciousness, he's not even aware of whether his body is on or off any more than a drunk person knows whether his coat is on or off. He who thinks that the living entity is the slayer or is slain is not aware of the truth. So does that mean that I can just kill somebody because Krishna is telling me I'm not your body? So I could just... What's your name? Dominique. Dominique. Okay, nice name. I can just insult Dominique and I could punch him and say, no problem, he's not the body. Don't, don't criticize me for hurting him. Here's an analogy that will explain the answer to that. Suppose there's a, a soldier in the war and under the direction of the generals and the captains, this soldier kills so many men. What happens when he returns home? He gets a medal, right? <coughs> so then he thinks, well, this is pretty good. And then he goes and kills somebody else who he's hated for so many years, and he thought, well, now's my chance. I learned war, uh, worship, and now I'll just kill him. And then what happens? Does he get a medal? No, they send him to the electric chair because he killed that one person on his own. So if Krishna is ordering to kill and he's personally there, then there's no problem because those people will uh, get liberation and they may even attain Krishna himself. But if I do anything on my own, independently, like if I insult Dominique or punch him, then I'll have to get punched back, if not by him, by somebody else. That's called the law of karma. Whatever act we do, we get that back. And then if somebody insults me and I wonder, why did that person insult me? I didn't do anything to him. Oh yeah, I remember in my last life I insulted Dominique. Got it. Now I know why I'm being insulted. <laughs> Then Krishna continues. How can a person who knows that the soul is indestructible, imperishable, eternal, and immutable, call, uh, kill anyone or cause anyone to kill? Then he gives another very good example. Just as a person accepts new garments, giving up the old and useless ones, so similarly at the time of death, a person gives up the old body and takes a new one. Do we ever be disturbed if our clothes get too old and then we take it off? Never get disturbed. We can't imagine such a condition now, can we? I can't. <coughs> but Krishna is promising 
realization of this, if we chant Hare Krishna with sincerity, sing his glories, read about him, hear about him, speak about him to others, engage all of our senses in his service, then all of our senses become so happy. The soul can never be cut to pieces by any weapon, nor can it be withered by the wind, nor moistened by water, nor can it be burned by fire. Our Prabhupada gave uh, an example in the ancient history of Socrates. Socrates was uh, preaching a philosophy. You know Socrates, everybody? He was preaching a philosophy that the people... No? Socrates is an ancient Greek philosopher. And he's preaching... He was preaching his own version of uh, transcendence. So uh, the government became after him. It was a wicked government. And when they caught him, they said to him, Okay, Socrates, now tell us. How shall we grave you? Grave you? So he said, well, first you have to catch me, then you can grave me. In other words, I'm not this body. Knowing this, you should not grieve for the body. But now when I'm hearing all these things, uh, you know, it's just not me. So what do I do? I can pray. To Krishna. Now I know that I'm an illusion. I can pray to Krishna. There are so many beautiful prayers, uh, especially the Hare Krishna mantra, which means, O oh, energy of God, O oh, God, O oh, Radha, O oh, Krishna, I'm suffering now due to complete illusion because I'm attached to this material world. Please, and I'm serving my material senses. Prabhupada gives an, an example of uh, a Vaishnav poet who's lamenting. Oh, for so long I've been serving my material senses, but they're never satisfied with my service. They keep saying, no, more, no, more, 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 no, no, I'm not satisfied. So then somebody says to him, okay, well, no problem, why don't you just give up the service then if they're not satisfied? So then the Vaishnava poet says, but the problem is that although my senses are not satisfied with my service, they're not kind enough to give me relief from that service. So this is chaos. So if, however, Krishna says, you can pray to him. We have so many... Um, you hold that up? Songbook? We have so many beautiful songs of praying to Krishna and Guru and the pure devotees and to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that's Krishna himself, disguised as a devotee. And these prayers are very powerful because the prayers are originally sung by other pure devotees. And Krishna, when he hears the prayer of his pure devotee, he'll immediately start listening. So if we pray their prayers, then uh, we'll get that result and we can become free. Then he's trying to help Arjun understand further. He said, Oh Arjun, for one who has taken birth, death is certain. And for one who dies, birth is certain. Therefore, in the unavoidable discharge of your duty, you should not lament. All created beings are manifest in the beginning, unmanifest in the beginning, before this body, then manifest in the interim stage, and then unmanifest again. So why should you lament for that, for the changes? Some look upon the soul as amazing, some hear about the soul as amazing, some describe him as amazing, but still no one understands him. But yet, that is us inside. The soul is um, more uh, beautiful than anything that anybody could possibly imagine on earth and more powerful than any one that you could possibly imagine not only on earth but in heavens like there's a sun god who makes the sun rise and 
set every day and all the planets rotate around the sun we learn in school and there's a rain god that makes it rain so our soul is even more powerful than that millions of times more powerful just we're in so much illusion that we uh, think that we're this tiny terrible terribly full of misery thing that takes birth terrible birth and nine months in the womb being bitten by the um, insects within the mother's body and bacteria within the mother's body and uh, all the uh, gushy stuff in the mother's body can't breathe then comes out upside down first thing is he's slapped around by the by the doctor he comes out half dead screaming in pain then he grows up He's in a crib, and when the mother's away, the baby's with some babysitter, and the baby starts crying because he wants his mother's breast milk, and the babysitter thinks, oh, he has some pain, so she gives him some bitter-tasting medicine, makes it worse. Then he starts going to school, and he's get envious of other kids in the school because they have better grades, and they get envious of him. And they're always quarreling with each other. Teacher's always chastising him. Then he just goes on and on. Then old age, all the people that he supported throughout his entire life, now that he's getting old, they're sick of him, they want to put him in an old age home. Then when he's, then when he's dying, all the relatives are surrounding him, weeping, and his eyes pop out of their sockets. Why? Because what's he seeing? He's seeing the constables of, of Yamaraj, the god of death, coming to take him. And where is he going? They all think that he's finished, but where is he going? For all of his sinful activities, even unknowing sinful activities, like stepping on an ant, he has to suffer. Unknowingly or knowingly, one has to suffer. If he's, if he's had an uh, illicit sex life, he had lots of girlfriends, illicit sex life, so what happens? He has to go to a planet where he has to embrace a molten, hot iron, opposite sex and forced to embrace her. And at the same time that he's embracing her, he's getting whipped by the constables of the god of, god of death. Or if he liked to drink alcohol, beer, <coughs> then he has to drink hot, molten iron. And that's the interim stage before he gets the next body. If he... Um, if he ate animals and he has to become a worm and in a planet called creamy bojanum and he has to be a worm and eat other worms and they eat him. It's really terrible. And the, the Vedas tell us all about these things. Otherwise, how would we know? So we're so lucky that we get to find out what's really happening because these eyes that we have, they're just like peacock feather eyes. Peacock feather is beautiful. Do you have any peacock feathers here? Krishna's turban, you see a peacock feather, very beautiful, colorful, like, you know, uh, what is that, that blue, what do you call it? Eyeshadow. Eyeshadow. Very beautiful peacock feather, but it cannot see anything. So the, uh, the um, eyes that don't see the personality of Godhead are just like the eyes of a peacock feather. So we're very fortunate that we're being given eyes by the Shastra, by the scriptures. And therefore, our uh, teachers teach us that we should be Shastra Chaksus, or we shouldn't try to see through these peacock feather eyes, but we should see through the eyes of the scripture, or see through the eye of knowledge. And Arjuna was worried. See, he had his material logic, but nobody can defeat Krishna, so might as well surrender. Arjuna's logic was, that, see, all these are my friends and relatives, cousins, uncles, grandfather. So if I don't kill them and we just all live together, then I'll be happy, they'll love me, I'll love them. So, our, so Krishna said, no, that's not what's going to happen at all. He said, if you don't fight this religious war, then, you, then you'll certainly incur sin by neglecting your duties in a religious war. 
and you'll lose your reputation as a fighter. <coughs> and all these relatives that you want to spare, they'll all uh, laugh at you and make you infamous. They won't respect you at all. So Krishna is the embodiment of past, present, and future. So nobody can outsmart Krishna. I was once um, in our spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada's uh, house in New Jersey in 1967. He had a house there for a couple of weeks. And um, he took us into one of the rooms. You want to sit on a chair? Uh, Pr Premananda? Yeah. Do you want to sit on a chair? No, You're okay? Okay. Okay. Um, so Prabhupada took us into one of the rooms where there's a picture of um, Mother Yasoda chastising Krishna um, because he was stealing butter and yogurt. And his friends were... What one time, I did not see him Bhagavatam. That we had been attacked by one ferocious demon. Then, which demon? Then it said, oh, hunger. We're very, very hungry. And now, coming into our nostrils is this very, very sweet smell um, coming from this um, Tao plantation. And it's also going into our stomach. So please help us to relieve this um, problem. So then they went to this plantation, and this was taken care of by an associate of Kamsa uh, called Denukasura. So Balaram, they said, if we go to this place, though, that it's guarded by this Denukasura, and anybody that comes near, that he and his associates, that they immediately annihilate them. That nobody goes near this place. What to speak of going near it? Near it. Even the birds up in the sky, they won't even fly over this place. Balaram and Krishna, they were laughing. How can an ass, you know, be so powerful? So then they went, Balaram in front. When um, they got to the um, grove, then Balaram, he took one tall tree, very, very tall, thin, and then he started to shake. And some tall fruit started to come down. Blah, 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 blah. Immediately, Denukasura, he got up and he went to see what, who was intruding in his, in his territory. And then he saw the very, very beautiful forms of Krishna and Balaram. Krishna with his very beautiful peacock feather his Pitambra, his golden yellow shawl, and next to him, Baladev, in front by the tree, uh, with his very beautiful white complexion, blue dhoti. Seeing immediately Denukasura, he charged towards Baladev, and then jumping this ass demon with his hind legs, both legs, with a very, very heavy push, poof, he just kicked Baladev in his chest. But Baldev was just standing there and not at all moved, not at all phased. Then Ukasura, he looked, he was amazed. Then again he went up to Baladev and then he turned round. Uh, and then he lifted up his hind legs and again he kicked him. But this time when he went to kick, Baladev very easily just caught hold of his legs with one hand and then just started to swing him round in a centrifugal way. And then he just took him and tossed him up towards a tall tree. Before this demon even reached the, tal, the top of the tree, uh, his life air had left. He hit, his body hit the tree, and then so many fruits started to come down. The tree also broke, and it fell and it hit one tree. And from the weight of that and the demon, that tree also broke and fell and hit another tree, and then another tree, and another tree, and in this way, trees were just scattered all over the place in, in such a short time. The friends of Denukasura, they saw how their master had just been killed by Baladev. And then immediately, they also got up and they started to attack Baladev and Krishna. And there was a great flurry of Baladev and Krishna just taking them and swinging them and then throwing them up into the trees. And in, within no time, the whole place was completely devastated. There were just tall trees, tall fruit, the bodies of these demons and blood. The place was such a mess. And then after Madhu Mangal, who was very hungry, he looked. He said, oh Krishna, I'm not hungry anymore. <laughs> Let's go home. <laughs> so, it's been explained that this pastime 
uh, it has very, very significant meaning. They're just like the different demons that were killed by Krishna, that they represent different anatas. So, Denukasura, he represents ignorance. That he's taken the form of an ass. And the ass, uh, he's the symbol of ignorance. Srila Gurudev has explained that in the rainy season, the ass will go and start to eat grass. But because of the rainy season, there's so much grass. And then the ass will look up. And the ass will see that, oh, that there's so much grass. I haven't eaten, but actually the ass has eaten so much. But he's just seen that I've not eaten. In the dry season, when there's no grass, the ass has eaten just a little bit. But then the ass will look up and the ass will see, oh, look, I've eaten all of this grass. Huh? And then the ass, by the, mind, by the power of his mind, just see the power of Maya, then his stomach will become very, very big, though he hasn't eaten anything, but he'll think, I have eaten. What is this? Prakriti Kriyamanani Gunai Savasaha Ahankara Vimudatma Kataham Itimanyate. That the ass is thinking that I'm eating, but actually, due to the influence of the seasons, the three modes of material nature, all this is going on. But the ass being a mudha, being ignorant, is thinking, I am doing. The living entity conditioned in this world, we're also going about uh, and apparently performing so many activities. But actually, these activities are being performed by this body, which is, full of, which is made of senses, mind, intellect. And these activities are being impelled by the three modes of nature according to our karma. We, the living entity, we're in there and we are observing uh, we're bringing consciousness, but we're just prisoners in this body of nine gates, walking here and there. But by illusion, we're thinking that, oh, I am doing everything. I am in control. I am so powerful, just like an ass. Also, this ignorance, uh, when the living entity comes into this material world, Krishna Bhuli Seji Vanadi Bahimuk Ataiva Mahitar Deha Samsara Duk, he becomes covered uh, by Maya. And the first covering, the first slap is, of illusion, this is avidya, ignorance. This avidya later develops into the other covering of the living entity, uh, which is where you have the different things which are explained in Madhur Kandambini, then rag or lust. This lust uh, and avidya, avidya is just a subtle form, a development of this lust. And the living entity, covered by lust, is forced to act in so many different ways. That's why in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna he says, or Arjuna asked, Atake na yam, papam charity purusham. He said, oh, 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 Krishna, why are we forced to act, even if we don't want to? What is the reason? Krishna says, Kam esha krod esha raja gun That due to lust, uh, which transforms into tamagun, uh, which is born from the mode of passion, one is acting like this. So how will one become free? So this pastime, we see that Krishna has killed so many demons, Putana, Trinavata, Shakatasura, Agasura. Uh, but now, Baladev, he's killing this de demon, Denukasura. Why? Because Baladev, he's a Kanda Guru Tattva. He's the whole, full manifestation of Guru Tattva. And the living entity who is covered by ignorance and covered by different anatas. What are those anatas? Sarup Brahm, Asat Trishna, Vidoy Dabalyam, and Aparat. No time to explain. So, the living entity covered by these... Good, should I explain? No time. The living entity covered by these different anatas, but especially we'll discuss Ridoya Dabalyam. That Ridoya Dabalyam, it has four divisions. First is Tucha Asakti. That the living entity is attached to very, very insignificant, ephemeral things of this world. Then Kutinati and Kapatya. This means duplicity, hypocrisy, uh, and also um, cheating and criticizing. That especially for one who has come to the lotus feet of Sadguru, one who's come to be able to do bhajan, then it shall have Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Thakur, he said, that it's better uh, to take birth in these species of worms, beasts, different animals, uh, then to come and still hold on to this kapatya and matsarya, envy. So this has to be given up, but very, very difficult. Very difficult to give up this hypocrisy, this duplicity, because we're bound by illusion. So how to give up? And the last is pratishta. There's 
Tutta Sakti, Kutinatika Patio one, Matsarya, Envy is another, and then Pratishta. Huh? So who can give up? Kanakamini, Pratishta Bhagini, Tadyate, E Vaishnav. That one who's given up this desire for the sense, sense objects of this world, Kanaka Kamini, the opposite sex, who's, who's, brief, okay, who's given up, Pratishta, uh, desire for name, fame, adoration, which is so subtle that practically up to the level of Bhav that this is there, how can give up? Only by mercy of Guru. So, um, Baladevi comes and he's killing this demon because these anatas, especially this anatta, this will be removed when we take that attachment, uh, which is born of ignorance that we have for this material world, for the objects of this world, for our mother, for our wife, for our children, for different things. And then we take that attachment and then we place it at the lotus feet of Guru. That love and affection, now we give it fully to Guru. Uh, then Guru, he is um, Sadhu Vaidya. He's a transcendental physician. Then he can perform the operation. Baladev, he comes with a plow, and with this plow, he's rooting up uh, the, the weeds which are in the field. And similarly, uh, he's, means he's rooting up the anatas which are within the field of the heart. And Guru, he's doing this, he's Nityananda Prakash, uh, Baladev Prakash. He's a manifestation of Baladev who's coming and he's mercifully making the field fertile. But for that field to be fertile, we have to offer it to Gurudev. But because we're conditional, our offering is conditional. So we have to keep on offering and offering and offering and offering uh, so that Gurudev can keep on performing that operation and make the heart nice and clean uh, so that that Bhakti Lata Beach, which is being planted by Guru Mercy, uh, so that this will grow very, very, very nice. So how he's giving his mercy? By his very merciful glance, by his embrace, by his, um, uh, his wishes, and especially satam prasangam mamadvirya samvido bhavanti vidkana rasaya nakata tat joshanat ashu apabhagavatmani chararati bhakti anukrimisimai Today, Kali Haru. Today, tomorrow. <coughs> Hare Krishna. Yesterday, Srila Gurudev mercifully given some initiation. Due to lack of time, we couldn't announce your spiritual name. Today, we will announce your spiritual name. And some more devotee has requested for initiation. It will take place tomorrow, 8.30 a.m. in Gurudev Bhajan Koti. And for gents, they have to save clean hair and clean dhoti. It will have to come like other dead devotees come. And tomorrow, due to Harinam Sankirtan, fire sacrifice will take place day after tomorrow. And Darshan for devotee who left over, like France, Italy, Holland, Lithuania, Latvia, Finland, Russia, and other countries, day after tomorrow, 10 a.m. here, Hare Krishna. And when Gurudev will announce the spiritual name, please. Let them listen their name first, then you can clap. Otherwise, you start clapping, they could not listen their name properly. Hare Krishna. Thank you for your cooperation. Hare Krishna. And the devotees who are uh, performing drama, be ready, make all the arrangements just now in a expert way so that nobody is disturbed, we can hear the name announcements. Srila Gurudev has given initiation mercifully to 86 Sorry, 88 devotees. Some of them have already left. We start with Mirnal Das from Kolkata. Please stand up when we call your name and Srila Gurudev will announce your new spiritual name. Mirnal Das Prabhu is here. What? <laughs> huh? Krishna Ki Jai. Francisco Chetena Crespo. Chaitanya Das Ki Jai. España, España. Andre Krieger from Germany. 
अनिरुद्ध अनिरुद्ध कृष्ण की जय अनिल कृष्ण की जय Then also from Germany, I believe Dresden, Ives or Ives, Weiland, Ives, Weiland. Jamuna Jivan Prabhu ki jai. Then from London, King Chong, not King Kong, but King Chong from London. Copy, copy, copy. कोकिल दास प्रभु की एंड फ्रॉम हॉलैंड शिवान ऑरेंजकरक जगमोहन प्रभु की फ्रॉम नेपाल बत्तु कृष्णा दास Bhattu Krishna Das Ki Jai. From Holland, Ravi Deku. From Holland. Rameshwar. Rameshwar Prabhu Ki Jai. From Berlin, Martine. Husband, husband Karsten. What do you want to do? Balaji. Malti Devi Ki Jai. Okay. Frank Berlin. Frank is here. Bhajahari. 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 Bhajahari Prabhu Ki Jai. Ravi Bain from England. Ravi. Ravi. Radha Charan Prabhu Ki Jai Matthew Austin from England Murali Mohan Ki Jai From Australia receiving Harinam Adikshap Rashma Bhagyani 